Our intersections presentation is a collaboration between a mother and a daughter. Restoried and restored. Queer family conundrums across the generations. Gypsy Hosking and Manyo. Thank you very much. Gypsy Hosking was one of the first children born through donor insemination to lesbian parents in Australia. Identifying as queer herself, she has dedicated to her life to challenging heteronormativity and homophobia. For 10 years, she has been living with a debilitating, invisible, incurable illness. She is a PhD candidate and she breeds rabbits. Manya has considerable experience challenging privilege, dominance and marginalisation in her personal and her professional life. She currently works with refugees, the Dulwich Centre and cares for her frail elderly mother. In all these roles, she draws on feminist and queer ideas and her training as a narrative practitioner. Manya and Gypsy, thank you. I'm Gypsy. And I'm Manya. Before we begin, we would like to add our respects to the Ngunnawal elders, both past and present, the traditional custodians of this place which we now call Canberra, and also to the Ghana people of the greater Adelaide region, whose land we both now call home. Because we are speaking from the intersectionality stream, we would also like to honour and acknowledge the efforts and activisms of all women of colour who first developed these ideas such as the 1970s Kombahi River Collective from Boston and Aileen Morton Robinson, a Goanpool woman from Queensland who gave us the book Talking Up to the White Woman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so intersectionality theory and practice shows us that all oppressions are connected and that addressing racism, white privilege, and the ongoing intergenerational impacts of colonisation, both in Australia and around the world, need to be central to our LGBTI politics. Like everyone in this room, we're all a complex mix of experiences of marginalisation and of privilege. In this presentation, we're just going to share a few snapshots about the complexities and conundrums of our experiences as a mother and daughter living, loving and working across the intersections of illness, age, culture and sexuality. Looking at the effects of some of the harsher stories told about us by dominant discourse, as well as our subversions of these and how we can become restored through restoring. From an early age, I lived in the intersections of culture, class and heteronormativity. My family and I emigrated from the Netherlands to Australia in 1956 when I was barely two. We were called New Australians at the time, although there were a lot of other more derogatory labels applied to us as well, like cheeseheads and clogwogs and others. Perhaps this is where my fascination with language began, as I learned how names and words were used to sort people into different categories and to assign these categories with different levels of worth. Even as a child, I could see that dividing and naming practices exerted a powerful influence over determining who had access to the best land, houses, jobs, education, health, status, safety and well-being. As a child, I could see that the less valuable piles had a lot of wogs in them, and I could see the unfairness, the injustice and the wrongness of that. At the same time, I was also aware that my parents and the immigrant communities I belonged to were determined to fight for change. But what I was less able to see as a child was that the piles people were sorted into were not two-dimensional, but multiple and complex, overlapping and interlocking. It was much more complicated than the simple us-against-them wars that we carried on as children roaming the streets of our neighbourhood. As a child, what I couldn't see was that as a Northern European New Australian, there were certain privileges accorded to me that weren't available to the darker skinned migrants. As a child, I rarely saw the Meru and Nurunjeri owners of the land I lived on, 
because they'd been driven out to the mission far outside the town boundaries. I absolutely was unable to see how I benefited from the marginalisation and exclusion that came with white colonisation, and I could not see how those privileges protected me from knowing that my community, my family and myself were implicated in these injustices enacted against Aboriginal people. And if Aboriginal people were only visible in my peripheral vision as a child, then intersex, trans and GLB people were utterly invisible. I first heard the word homosexual when I was about 18. I was working at the local fruit factory along with my mother and her friends, women whom I loved and trusted deeply. They warned me to stay away from those itinerant women who act like men. And I believed them when my respected elders told me they're dangerous, unnatural and sexually perverted. And yet, within 10 years of that moment, I was living, loving and raising children in a lesbian family. What is interesting to me is discovering how those wonderful women elders of mine came to be used as vehicles for heteronormativity and in doing so, maybe learn some of the sneaky ways dominant discourse can trick me into serving its agenda as well. And what is even more interesting to me, however, is discovering how that powerful heterodominant discourse came to be named, defied and subverted to the extent that I'm able to stand here today together with my beloved daughter, with our lives, a testament to the strength, beauty and diversity of same-sex families. So my older brother and I, born in 1983 and 87, so we were some of the first children to be born via donor insemination to lesbian parents in Australia. So Manya uh, did not give birth to me, but she is one of my mothers. My brother, Manya's biological son, is not biologically related to me, but he is my brother. We have been fighting my whole life to have our relationships accepted. The list of invalidating moments is long and includes the first time we went to Threadbow and the ski lift operator refused to sell us a family ticket because he said, a family means a mother and a father with two kids. My first day of school, every Mother's Day, parent-teacher nights, or questions over who could sign my permission slips at school, to the 10 years where I pursued my dream to be an elite athlete. And I decided, considering the culture of homophobia in sport, that it would be easier to present as a child of a single mother. Through hundreds of little comments or microaggressions from both mainstream and same-sex communities about real mothers and real families, to questions being asked about whether my brother and I had the same right to sit with the family at our grandparents' funeral and to be listed on the order of service as a grandchild. That's why it's so important for us to be able to stand in front of you all today and not only have our relationship recognised, but positively affirmed as well. And that's also why it's important for us at this conference to engage with intersectionality when we're talking about LGBTI health because intersectionality helps us expose inclusions and exclusions, and the ways in which certain concerns come to be named as universal concerns and priorities for our society, while others remain silenced and marginalised. Take, for example, the mother-daughter relationship. There are particular norms about this relationship that are shaped by heteronormative discourse and which define who gets access to services within the health system and who is excluded. When I was a baby, I suffered a life-threatening condition which saw me rush to Canberra from the south coast of New South Wales for emergency surgery. My mum, Annie, went with me in the ambulance and Manya stayed behind to organise care for my brother. As my biological mum, Annie had unquestioned entry into the hospital and she was given a room so that she could stay with me. And this was based on the assumed truth of a baby needing her mother to increase her chances of survival. I headed for Canberra the morning after Gypsy had been rushed off in the ambulance. I knew I was going to be labelled as a non-relative in the eyes of the medical institutions, and as such I would have none of a mother's rights, and in fact would be strictly excluded from the intensive care ward. 
The accepted truth that underpinned this health policy was that non-relative visitors posed an unnecessary additional stress and a risk of infection for the baby. I clearly remember running over and over these obstacles in my mind like a rat in a maze with no way out all through that long agonising bus trip from Bega to Canberra. What on earth was I going to do? I was uncomfortable in hospitals at the best of times, so the prospect of walking in and simply getting lost or being exposed as an interloper and being thrown out was really very, very daunting. I'd also heard stories of children who'd been removed from their biological mothers for being in lesbian households, and I was deeply worried about our family coming under the close scrutiny of the authorities. But I also knew I had no choice but to try. I couldn't leave my co-mother alone to deal with those scary medical interventions. After all, in the eyes of our family, I was Gypsy's mother and I had a clear responsibility to be there. And while Gypsy was not the child of my body, she was utterly and absolutely the child of my heart and there was a clear possibility she could die during surgery. By a lucky chance, my spiralling thoughts latched onto something one of our nurse friends had said. A hospital is a big, unwieldy bureaucracy. The staff are constantly shifting on and off roster. No one's ever quite sure who is family and who is not. If you act like you have a right to be there, they might think someone else has authorised your entry. Perhaps, if I embraced my own preferred story about our family, to the exclusion of all other thoughts, and wrapped myself tightly enough in the knowledge that my family needed me, and that I was a strong, brave woman, and I would not let them down, then I might just pull this off. Hospitals and the 1980s health policy based on heteronormative ideas might have been huge and powerful giants, and a queer heart mother's love just a small, insignificant sparrow in comparison. But a sparrow can always hide behind a giant's back and dart out to fly much faster than a giant can walk. So the story of that hospital encounter has many chapters, but suffice to say, I found my way in and it took nearly a week for the hospital authorities to discover Gypsy had two mothers staying in the hospital <laughs> and that one mother or the other was beside her for every moment of every day. We never left her alone. Our precious daughter survived and the bonds forged in those acts of shared love and devotion proved a powerful affirmation of our family in general and of our relationship as, as heart mother and daughter in particular. It became an unshakable foundation on which to stand during the many battles for recognition of our relationship that were still to come. So let us now look at a snapshot of my life story some 28 years later. So for me to have an open, honest and authentic conversation about myself and my life, there are three things that I have to come out about three things that defy the default. I'm a lesbian, I have lesbian parents, and I have an invisible chronic illness. My sexuality gets lost in stories of my illness, and my illness gets lost in stories of my sexuality. My family is always getting lost in stories of both. When people don't already know at least one of these things about me, then even the most basic conversation becomes complicated and I have, I have to decide whether this is a situation where I wish to disclose, and if so, what and how much do I, want, do I wish to tell. So first point, I'm a lesbian. I'll keep this brief, as most people here uh, will be well familiar with the challenges of coming out. Um, I was lucky to grow up with lots of women who spanned a spectrum of sexualities, so I had no internalised homophobia to overcome but I was still very shaken by the negative reactions of some of my peers in high school. Now, I'm trying to find my place as a queer young person with an invisible chronic illness, and I'm troubled by the silence and lack of visible overlap between chronic illness or disability in general and our queer community. In all my research about chronic fatigue syndrome and how to live well with it, I never see diverse sexuality or gender mentioned or acknowledged. Furthermore, despite the many efforts of queer people with disabilities, disability remains on the margins of LGBTI politics. At this conference, I hope that we can challenge ableism and include all bodies in all of our conversations. 
So secondly, I have lesbian parents. So one of the most complicated things for me coming out was negotiating the stereotype that queer kids raise, sorry, queer parents raise queer kids. So the Christian right spews a whole lot of homophobia in the guise of the best interests of the child, arguing that gay and lesbian parenting is harmful because they will raise sexually deviant and gender confused kids. So I was often caught in this impossible bind where honesty about myself could be used as ammunition against my parents and queer parents in general. I'll share with you one memorable example. When I was at uni, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome and the doctor I was seeing recommended that I go on the pill to treat the effects. So after going away to think about it, I came back and said, yeah, look, I've decided to go on the pill to treat the polycystic ovaries. Oh, and also I need a repeat script for my antidepressants. Now, these are antidepressants previously prescribed by a different doctor, but at the same medical clinic. So the first thing that the new doctors do is check your family medical history and your living circumstances. So she looks over my file and sees that I was born via donor insemination to two lesbian mums and muses. Hmm, you've had a fairly unusual upbringing, haven't you? Do you think that this has contributed to your depression? <laughs> so at that time, I was still dealing with the aftermath of an unexpectedly rocking coming at, rocky coming out. So I replied honestly, saying that, well, yeah, sexuality is part of that. Oh, so you <laughs> think you're homosexual? Uh, yeah. And how long have you felt that way? Uh, I, I don't know, um, late high school, maybe. Oh, that's a bit late. Most people have felt that way all their lives. Well, I wasn't attracted to anyone before have that. Have you had any therapy on this issue? Thinking that she meant my rocky coming out and the issue of homophobia <laughs> in a heteronormative society, I said, yeah, I've talked to some counsellors. However, the issue of homophobia had not even entered her consciousness. What she wanted to know was... But have you worked on these issues specifically? Have you seen a psychiatrist and said up front... I need to examine the family pressures which have influenced my sexuality. You know, you need to be assertive and find someone who's good in this area. Cue my baffled silence. What issues? What is this doctor even talking about? But my silence meant nothing to her. She simply forged on from her position of heteronormative power. You see, you have had quite unique pressures on you. It's possible that unconsciously you identify as homosexual to show your parents you hold no prejudice against them and you approve of their lifestyle choice. You're saying, see, I don't care that you're gay because I'm gay too. It's nothing to be ashamed of. All children want to please their parents. I just think you should go talk with a psychiatrist so you can discover your true sexual identity, not the one you've been putting on. You need to examine the pressures that have made you feel this is the only option. You don't want to be limited to the corner you've backed yourself into. There's a whole range of sexualities, you know. <sighs> now, I'm sorry to say that that conversation was not exaggerated. As I was so stunned by her reaction, I wrote down a word-for-word -word transcript as soon as I left the clinic so that I could read it over and go, did that really just happen? In that moment, I couldn't challenge her. Uh, but later, I did put in a formal complaint about her to the University Health Service, and I got the story published. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. So, the third thing that I need to come out about is that I have an invisible, disabling, chronic illness. So, 10 years ago, I got sick and then I just <clears throat> never got better. Um, eventually, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a debilitating and incurable illness characterised by extreme fatigue, body pain, cognitive dysfunction, and many more unpleasant symptoms. Now, it's really important for me to acknowledge that my suffering during this illness has been minimalised by my privilege. If I didn't have financial and physical support, uh, from my family, which and that support is enabled by their race and their class privilege, or I didn't have the money to keep seeing doctors and allied health professionals, or the English language skills to negotiate all the Centrelink forms, 
then I would likely not have the resources to be able to stand here speaking to you today. So the longer my illness went on and the sicker I got, the more parts of my life and my identity became lost to me. So I lost my claim to identify as an athlete, a student, an activist and a worker. Soon I was left with only the reality and the identity of the chronically ill, aka the failed healthy person. So over the last few years, I've worked really hard to embrace my illness and to integrate it into a positive identity and life story. But to my surprise, I found people were really uncomfortable about me identifying as a person with chronic illness and being open about the experience. People continually feel the need to deny my honest experience by giving me a pep talk or sharing a possible cure or a new diet or to tell a story about a friend who had the exact same thing that I've got, but they're fully cured now. And this is such a common dominant cultural response that a feminist blogger named Anaham created a bingo game out of all the unwelcome things the health privilege say to people living with invisible chronic illness. So when I was trying to be open, honest and authentic about my life, I was positioned as a pessimist who was just not trying hard enough to get better. You have to stay positive, I'm told. They could find a cure, I'm told. And the classic, oh, but you look so good, you don't look sick at all. And I'm not just talking dominant culture silencing here either. For example, when campaigns from within our queer community argue for marriage equality by holding up the image of the highly adjusted, heterosexual and healthy children who are statistically proven to be just like children raised in heterosexual families, I get to feel like I've failed again. The image portrayed of the typical same-sex family is often that of the able-bodied, white, middle-class nuclear family. In this way, marriage equality campaigns can unwittingly contribute to the silencing and invisibilising of children and young people from queer families who live with physical or mental illness or who live in the intersections of many other marginalised communities. As we said at the start of this presentation, we are each of us a complex mix of privilege and oppression. All of us inadvertently enact exclusion from our positions of privilege. In 1988, Peggy McIntosh described it as a knapsack of unearned assets and opportunities carried blindly on our backs. So much a part of us, we forget it's there. This privileged blindness leaves us at risk of making erroneous assumptions and judgments. My training as a narrative practitioner has given me some strategies for minimising the risk of causing unintended harm, which I would now briefly like to share. For example, when I sit down in a therapeutic or community setting, I try to remember that every conversation shapes identity and reproduces or subverts normative judgement often by positioning people on a continuum of success or failure. Every conversation circulates ideas about what constitutes pathology and what does not. And every conversation enacts individualising and blaming practices. Knowing that I'll always be positioned in places of privilege and power when I'm performing my profession, I ask myself, how can I offset the ever-present hazards of being used as a vehicle for social control when my intention is always to work towards social justice? Well, firstly, I can hold myself directly accountable to the marginalised persons and communities that I work with. Dominant culture requires me to be accountable to professional codes of conduct, agency policies, performance indicators, but none of these require direct accountability to the people and the communities we're supposed to be helping. Direct accountability means building genuine relationships with people from a diverse range of communities and just routinely checking in with them. It means ensuring that the concerns and the interests of those communities are brought from the margins to the centre by taking what Michael White called a decentered but influential position in therapy and community work. Secondly, I can hold myself accountable to my peers I can make sure that I'm in close contact with colleagues who will engage in robust, critical, reflexive conversations with me about our practice. And thirdly, I can try to visualise the three-dimensional intersectional web of power I'm stepping into upon entering each new therapeutic conversation. 
I can try to see who else is positioned in the intersectional web surrounding me and where they sit, who is immediately visible and who is in the shadows. I can listen for expressions of failure or self-condemnation because these are likely to point to instances of oppression. I can use inquiry rather than offering expert diagnosis, externalise problems rather than locate them within people or within communities, use experience near language that closely matches that of the community I'm accountable to, and listen for the values, hopes, purposes, commitments and intentions of that community because these expressions will provide many opportunities for news of difference, leading to the rich description of alternative storylines, preferred identity conclusions, and new possibilities for exercising agency. So, back to the everyday telling of my life stories. I couldn't easily talk about my sexuality, dating, relationships, my home life, my work, or lack thereof, or my thesis on children with lesbian and gay parents. I was fast running out of options. The failure story lurked down every avenue, and the invitation to silence, to avoid disclosure and awkward conversations was immense. But then, during one of the hardest patches of my illness, my mum Annie gave me a bunny rabbit to brighten my increasingly gloomy days. And from there, my passion for bunnies took off and my growing skills and knowledge in rearing them and breeding the most beautiful babies became an opening into a new preferred territory of identity. I had found a conversation lifeline. By chance, I had found an activity, an alternative storyline and an associated preferred identity that everybody likes, bunnies. <laughs> So, instead of being trapped in the failed sick person story, I was delighted to re-story as the crazy bunny lady of McGill. And in doing so, I was restored to a sense of worth and well-being. So, cultivating an, an eccentric bunny lover identity was a playful and fun way to step outside the story of failure and to position myself in what narrative therapy calls a preferred story. And now, I can avoid the awkward questions of how are you or are you better yet? Because the first thing that people now ask me is, how are your bunnies? <laughs> so just to finish, I would like to share one short final snapshot. As well as being mother to Gypsy, I'm a daughter myself. And the relationship I have with my mother shines a light on a whole different set of intersections across age, illness, culture and sexuality. At this point in time in dominant Australian culture, elderly people are often storied as being a burden, a drain on resources. And those of us who choose to care for our loved elders are often storied as martyrs, worthy but boring colourless people sacrificing our own needs. The idea of a live-in carer also living an active polyamorous sexuality seems a contradiction in terms. In much the same way that the idea of a lesbian mother was considered an oxymoron or a contradiction in terms back in the early 1980s. In 1982, my mother and I were sitting in a cafe in a small country town in South Australia. I'd taken the unusual step of inviting my mother out for coffee and her typical Dutch response had been to say, why go out and pay when we have good coffee and better cake at home? But I'd insisted because I wanted to be sure no other family member would overhear the news that I was pregnant, courtesy of an anonymous donor and an inseminating syringe, and she was going to become grandmother in a lesbian family. My mother's voice, never quiet at the best of times, had boomed out incredulously, you did what? With what? But that's impossible. <laughs> at that snapshot moment in 1982, heteronormativity, speaking through my mother, deemed the lesbian mother an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms, an absurd impossibility. Everyone knew lesbian sex couldn't produce babies. Religious, religious dominance deemed homosexuality an abomination and a sin, and small-town Australian culture deemed same-sex relationships sick and disgusting. The idea of raising a child in that environment seemed utterly abhorrent. But over the next 30 years, Thanks to the efforts of our queer communities, 
and the love and support of people like my mother, these stories of abomination and sin and impossibility were challenged and utterly transformed. And it's my hope that in the next 30 years, stories about caring for the sick, the elderly, the asylum seeker, the differently abled, will all be transformed too. My 94-year-old mother passed away three weeks ago, having lived out peacefully the last two years of life in the home that I'd made for her with the love and support of all our friends and family. The story of caring for her that I have to tell is not one of burden, but of reciprocity, beauty, and joy in partaking of the mysteries of living and dying. In refusing the neoliberal judgment that measures the worth of our lives in economic terms, I found immeasurable riches. Throughout our lives, my mother and I each gave to the other according to our abilities at the time and received according to our needs. And I salute my beautiful mother and her living legacies. So in conclusion, um, <clears throat> we need our political judgments in order to take action. But we can become more skilled in noticing and negotiating the boundaries, the inclusions and the exclusions as we make them. We need to become more skilled in noticing who we exclude. And we can become much better at owning where we sit in a complex three-dimensional web of power and privilege and continually revising our priorities in light of that. She's not going. <laughs> <laughs> we can take heart from the irrefutable truth of our 28-year-old heart mother-daughter relationship as we stand here before you. Our relationship proves you don't need blood ties to be family. And if anyone can be family, then everyone can be family. Therefore, if we are all family, then your struggle is my struggle. And until all of us are free, none of us are free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.